So after this point in time, uh, the John and Jerry, who were the folks that started the Research Institute, where I, where I have worked for many years and who were two of my key mentors, um, went on to uh, apply these simple kind of techniques they were working using with families and teachers in a wide variety of settings. And one of the things they did along the way is realize that the picture that you get of a problem when you're just working with uh, families that come into your clinic and just working with those kids is, could be really different than the picture you get when you watch people develop over time. And so they started a series of studies that followed families over a lengthy period of time. And one of those started in 1979 or so, and then uh, got really going in 1983. And that study still continues today, where they followed uh, boys from fourth grade in schools in Eugene and Springfield, Oregon, where I live. Um, and uh, now they're in their 40s and they've watched their families and their kids. And about 60% of these kids, uh, they, they were kids from neighborhoods in Eugene and Springfield that are similar to the neighborhoods that were uh, where the people that are in this lift study that I'm going to talk about. They uh, tried to recruit the entire fourth grade classes of schools in Eugene and Springfield where there were uh, higher police contact, so the police had more contact with uh, juveniles in those neighborhoods. And um, they recruited 207 boys, and they followed them through most of their lives. And uh, I think maybe 60% of those boys have gone on to have involvement with um, juvenile justice, and another percentage have gone on to have involvement with criminal justice, but they were just families living in communities. And uh, so that's one set of research that will inform what I'm going to talk about today. Another set is uh, randomized controlled trials that have been conducted with kids in different circumstances. And one, uh, one was kids in uh, juvenile justice. So there's been a couple of trials that have been done with uh, boys in juvenile justice and in girls in juvenile justice. And these same basic principles were applied. The difference was that uh, you know, in, in Oregon, if a kid is um, getting involved with the police a lot and they've con committed some serious crimes, they'll go off to like a state training school, but most kids end up going into a neighborhood-based kind of group home setting. And so what we did is a variety of uh, randomized trials where we looked at uh, kids who were going to go to a group home setting because of their delinquent behavior, their criminal behavior, they would be randomly assigned to either go into a foster family where it'd be one child and two parents, or they'd go into a, a, a group home where there might be 20 kids and shift staffing. And we compared what uh, are outcomes different. You know, if you apply these simple kind of techniques and try to get kids uh, calm down in the home and et cetera, et cetera, can there be a difference? And, and the reality is yes, the kids who go into the family setting do better in the long run than the kids who go into the group home setting where they're, work, where they're mostly spending a lot of time with other kids like them who've been in a lot of trouble. It makes sense. Uh, we went on to do studies in the school system and nonprofits and Lyft is what, one of the school system studies. Uh, and over the last 12 years, I've been working with incarcerated mothers and fathers in Oregon. Uh, again, using variations of, this, of these techniques. But in that case, the, uh, the work has focused on um, developing a program with, uh, with incarcerated moms and dads as key players as we develop this program and with families who are out in the community and taking care of the children of incarcerated parents. And uh, we have developed and tested now two programs and have had some good success using simple techniques that came out of this Timmy tape that you just saw. <laughs> so anyway, uh, just wanted to give that background for you. So the, uh, pro the LIFT program is very much came out of this milieu of work where people were trying to apply clinical practices with families. Uh, along the way, they were trying to make up a theory to explain what was going on, but it was very much a theory that came out of the practice. And then uh, <coughs> the work was punctuated by doing research studies, often something like a randomized controlled trial where you'd try out a practice and say, well, does this work? And if it doesn't work, they discard it and try something else. So that's the milieu 
that the LIFT program came out of. In fact, this is a slide that summarizes uh, information from about 10 different randomized trials that were done. They're all based in these simple kind of practices with a wide variety of families, some from child welfare system involvement, some from juvenile justice system involvement, um, young kids, old kids. And there's a variety of good outcomes that have been found, but only when there can be changes in these programs on some basic increases of certain positive parenting practices and decreases in the family in certain negative parenting practices. And if an intervention can successfully make differences in these things, so skill encouragement, positive involvement, effective discipline techniques, family problem solving techniques, and monitoring and supervising kids, if we can do things that help increase those and decrease these negative parenting practices. One is uh, negative reciprocity, which is if I start yelling at you, you yell back at me. If that can decrease, that usually helps people feel better about being with each other. <laughs> if they do that a lot, you don't want to be with that person. Escalation, which is starting off with negativity back and forth and then having it escalate to something more severe. For example, like somebody hitting somebody else or doing something very severe. And then negative reinforcement. The idea there is somebody, uh, uh, you're, you're in a fight with somebody and, and you keep ramping it up, ramping it up, and you come down so hard that the response is that somebody just backs off. And that you wanted them to back off. You were angry and you wanted them to back off. The problem is they didn't do it until you came down really hard. And unfortunately, when that happens, when you escalate that much and the person backs off, it unfortunately increases the likelihood that you're going to do that again because it worked. And it also increases the likelihood that that person's going to back off. And so you get stuck in this trap where you escalate and escalate. It stops things <coughs> up. But that's when Jerry was talking on the tape about people being in pain. What he's talking about is people teaching each other to fight with each other and to solve problems by being mean and angry and aversive to each other. And that doesn't, isn't a good ingredient for happiness. It doesn't set you well up for being a good student in school. It's not a good place to be. So anyway, there's a wide variety of, of positive outcomes that we found in these various clinical-based studies. These are not prevention studies. On, um, child substance use, noncompliance, delinquent behaviors, et cetera. But the, but the other thing is that, as was illustrated at the end of that movie, it's really um, difficult to be a parent when your kids are disrespectful to you, when they're not cooperating with you, when they're fighting with you all the time, and you don't feel very happy. And uh, it's hard to be functional in your adult relationships when that's going on. And as you can see in this tape in kind of an idealized way when, when things were going better with Timmy, then the couple was happier, you know? And uh, so. So parent management training, which is the, which is the core background to the LIFT study, uh, focuses on an empowering parents with some simple core strategies for how to encourage the skill development in their kids, and I'm talking about interpersonal skills, how to get along with people, how to set limits, so when kids do something, uh, how to set kids up so that they know what their limits are, and then sticking to those limits, <coughs> how to monitor and supervise their children so that they pay attention and know what's going on, um, how to solve problems in the family in a constructive way when things aren't working well, and just how to generally be present. You know, unfortunately, we're in a society now where it's hard to be present with each other. There's lots of distractions. It's, uh, it's amazing, you know, how, uh, you know, everywhere you look, people are spending more time looking at this little glowing screen, you know, than they are looking at each other. And, uh, you know, the life is up here, not down there, you know. So, uh, Anyway, the, the programs that were developed at Oregon Social Learning Center uh, really do have a good base that, of randomized controlled trials. That, and it, uh, the, the core program that developed that is uh, related to LIFT 
is considered one of two well-established treatments for dealing with conduct disorder kids who already have conduct disorder. And today we're talking about kids who don't have that yet, but this is the base. And so uh, programs from OSLC are on a variety of federal best uh, practices lists. And the core components from OSLC weren't unique, unique to OSLC in the 1960s. There were a lot of uh, people working in the same way around the country, and these kind of techniques kind of sprung up. So they, aren't, they didn't only come from OSLC, but it, this is a table where I looked at practices that uh, were developed at OSLC or derived or similar to things at OSLC where, where I worked for many years. And you can see about 80% 80, 80 of the programs that, that show up on uh, federal best practices lists that are really centered on programs that have had randomized controlled trials relate back to these simple ideas. So, so that's kind of a, the research base. So from the longitudinal studies that were done at OSLC and elsewhere, a key point to take away <coughs> is that uh, at every age, there are certain problem behaviors that you'll see. So, you know, with, uh, with, uh, with younger kids, you know, it's often not sharing or not obeying or having temp temper tantrums. And, and at that age, all kids do that. But there are some kids that that do it a little more than others, that's the little yellow, and then there's some kids who do it a whole lot, and usually that's maybe three, four, five percent of kids, and those are the kids that, that really drive their parents crazy in, in these ages, and they drive their daycare workers crazy, and they drive everybody else crazy because they do it so much. So these kids, some of them will go on when they're five or six years old to do more of that behavior and to also add more behaviors, like more physical aggression and not following rules in school and things like that. Some of these kids that are high rate will go on to be high rate at this age, and some will not. And one thing that can help those kids not be that way is their parents learning how to deal with their kids in a different way. You can't, you know, my wife and I have six children, and I'll tell you, everyone is very different. And some of the techniques I'm talking about today have worked really well with some of those kids, and others have been complete disasters, you know? <laughs> so none of the tools that are talked about in this program are helpful for everybody, for every person, for every child. But some of them are, and on average, which all of these clinical trials tell you is on average what happens, on average these techniques are helpful. That doesn't mean they're helpful for everybody, but on average they are. So, so anyway, the, the notion here is that there's always going to be some kids that are doing difficult things more than other kids at each age group. And some of the kids that are doing that will stay there and, and stay worse, and others will drop down. And it depends on what happens. And the primary shaper of that is the adults in the child's life. It's their mom, it's their uncle, it's their aunt, it's their coach, it's their teacher. It's the, those these are the people that will sh shape what happens with these kids as long as we're around as adults. But if we choose not to be around and the kid is spending all their time with their peers, with their friends, then it's their friends that are shaping those behaviors. And their friends are probably not going to use techniques like this. And their friends may or may not be in trouble. But if they are involved in more severe things like, um, um, you know, early drug use, early sexual behavior, stealing, things like that, or, or even kind of flirting with gangs, et cetera, et cetera. The longer, the farther a child goes in the process and gets more isolated from adults in their life who are willing to try to be role models, to try to do good things, the worse things go. And of course, as, as you get to this point in time, you know, then it not only is uh, deviant peers or other peers that are getting in trouble, but it's adults who are involved in criminal activities, who this is their way of life, and they are welcoming people to come in. So, so anyway, in every state, in every country, we have pro issues like this, where kids at any stage in life are exhibiting a certain problem behaviors, and the difference is, what do the people in their lives do at that point? And that's, that's what LIFT is about. So there are a variety of preventive kind of things that can be done at each stage that are more helpful. And uh, I know you have this in your packet, so you can read that more carefully. 
So the key, so social learning theory or social interaction learning kind of a theory is what is behind Lyft. If you ever want to read more about that, there's some references that I've put on the very last page of this uh, first session. But the basic idea is that a child uh, may be living in a, you know, each child lives in a broader context. There may be all kinds of things going on in, in that child's life. Poverty, lack of skills, maybe, it, uh, you know, historical trauma, you know, uh, you know com uh, your family recently came from another country where there was a war, or you're a Native American in this country, and you have, you know, this huge weight in your life and your culture from all these really bad things that happened recently and carry on. Or it might be more immediate trauma, or you might live in a really tough neighborhood, et cetera, et cetera. All of these surround the kid, but what can make, and, and all of them can negatively impact the child, but what can buffer a child from this is what their parents do, is what their teachers do. And that's really the only shot we got, because there's nobody else, you know? So, so what we try to do in these programs is help people uh, identify when they're stuck in bad habits and develop new habits that are more constructive. It's, it's, it's very simple. So one way, a simple way to look at this model is there are adverse contexts that impact children, poverty, et cetera, et cetera. These can be very disruptive to being a parent. It makes it harder to be a parent if you're working three jobs and you're not making any money doing it. Uh, and you're not present, but somebody is present and that's the parent that these kinds of techniques would be helpful with. But another key part of that is that the parents that's not present, that's bringing in the money, needs to be supportive of that work and understand what's going on and, and say, OK, that's OK. Um, so adverse contacts disrupt parenting. They tend to uh, lead to more situations where people are stuck in unhappy patterns of behaving with each other, where uh, uh, and so what we try to do in these interventions is help develop more positive, helpful patterns and that that can positively <coughs> impact child adjustment. A more complicated way to look at it is this, which you have and can read in your packet. But the main idea to take away from the big shot picture here is that at each stage in life, there's different important things that need to happen between a child and a parent. And, uh, and if they happen, you increase the likelihood that things will go better later. So for example, when, uh, when a child is in the womb, if the mom isn't using substances and isn't smoking and isn't introducing um, you know, things into the environment inside of her that are not going to be good for brain development, if you can stop those things, <coughs> that's better for the kid. It sets them up for better success later. If a mom does that, it doesn't mean that the child is necessarily set up to be, you know, to have problems in their life, but they might be. And so if you don't do those things, it's better than doing those things. But at each stage in life, you kind of have, a, have that situation. But during the early stages of life and early childhood, you know, generally there's less people to have to work with. You know, there's the parents or the aunts and the uncles or the grandparents or whoever raising that child and maybe the child's in preschool or Head Start or wherever and there's, there are people there, but it's relatively simple. But then when you start getting older and the kids get older and are spending more time out in the neighborhood, then things get much more complicated. So it's, it's easier to intervene early because there's less people to intervene with. But then as you get into middle childhood, then you've got the child in the school. In the school, there's the home environment, and then there's the peers, which often is out in the neighborhood. So now you've got three places that you've got to pay attention to at least. And then when a child gets in and out of, into adolescence, you've got all that. But then if a kid has been getting trouble all the way along, now they're probably spending more time with other kids who are in trouble, and then it's really complicated. So the earlier <coughs> that you can do things, the better. Doesn't mean that it's impossible here, but it's really, really tough. Last, this week I was uh, in Guatemala meeting with folks from El Salvador and Honduras and we were talking about, and, and Guatemala, and we were talking about situations in some of the neighborhoods where um, gang life has really taken over, you know, and what do you do in that situation? And it's a very, very tough situation. And so those, this is the issues that we were talking about there. 
the thing is that in the end, uh, all that we have as parents or teachers is the fact that we have time to be with somebody. And what we do when they're with them is important. And so even in that tough situation, you still have the same thing, but if you're gonna get, if a gang is gonna shoot you because you're a teacher, what are you gonna, and, and you're trying to intervene, what are you gonna do? It's very much different context, difficult situation. Can I ask a question? Is yes. this slide available online or anywhere? Uh, I can send it to you. Anything that you see today that you'd like, just let me know, and I, we can give you the PowerPoints. I, I could send you the PowerPoints, yeah, so. Yeah, so my emails, that's why my email's at the back of this, so anything you want, just let me know and I'll send it off. Yes. Uh, I was looking at you and not looking at and listening, and so you was pointing at the board, but which of um, the, the middle childhood and the adolescent, you say get much tougher in which area? Oh, I was just saying that uh, a key issue, and it depending on the, the neighborhood you live in, adolescence could begin at seven, or you can give at 14, you know, it depends. But uh, what I was saying is that the more adults, the more, the more positive adults that want their child to succeed check out, and the more those kids get involved with other kids that are getting in trouble, or they get involved with adults who have criminal intentions and are not caring about the child and their success, the harder it gets. And so I was just saying this is the, the peer <coughs> group. So in this program, what we're talking about is working with families early on when this high-risk peer group situation hasn't kicked in yet. Yeah. So uh, a difficult thing that some folks have with this type of thinking about focus on behaviors is that obviously as humans we're more complicated than just behaviors. We have thoughts, we have feelings. And, and in the past, in intervention with kids as in the 50s and the 60s when that was first beginning, the focus really was mostly on thoughts. And behaviors were seen as something that follows from thoughts. So if you got your thinking right, your behavior will follow. This is something very common in the prison situation uh, where I work that it's very uh, <coughs> common notion that you know criminals think differently than the rest of us. And so we have to change the way they think and then their behaviors will be different. That's a very popular theory. I don't personally believe it, but it is very popular. Uh, but it's possible that if you change thoughts and those start going differently, you will change behaviors to some extent. And of course, your feelings will change. And everything's linked up. But what we see and the work that came out of this you know, old time tape that I just showed you was that if you can find a way to change very simple behaviors, very simple behaviors between people. If you can do that, their thoughts and their feelings will change. And if you do it in a positive way, they can change in a positive manner. And so your desire to have a person think right about life or feel differently about life can change with some simple behaviors. That's all, it's a very simple idea. You may not believe that, and that's okay. But that's the idea here that we're talking about. So the, uh, from this work that occurred over about 20 years, uh, the main key points that came out of that uh, is that interventions that work with families need to focus on six things. How to spend positive time with kids. How can you set up so that as an adult, you're spending positive quality time with children uh, encouraging participation in normative behaviors. So behaviors that lead to, uh, to ending up sitting in a room like this where you're, you all have jobs and you all are living constructive lives and you get to do things like this rather than spending time out on the street and doing things that may end you locked up in prison. Uh, teaching behaviors in small steps. Uh, providing consistent, mild, and small consequences for misbehavior. So instead of waiting until somebody's crossed the line so much that you feel like you just gotta bring the hammer down, you know, you get kids when they're doing little problem behaviors and help them learn 
how to do better. People often talk about spanking and more violent responses as a way to uh, you know, teach a child how to behave. But the way to teach any of you in your jobs how to do a new skill that is difficult is to have somebody guiding you, helping you, show it, telling you when you did the right thing, telling you when you did the wrong thing, not making you feel awful when you messed up that Excel file or when you did the wrong formula. That's how we learn things in regular life. You know, it's not by the boss not helping you at all and then coming in and hitting you on the head because you did something wrong. That you learn nothing that way. So the idea here, except that you just want to avoid that person. So this, <coughs> this the idea of, of breaking things down and thinking about behavior simply. And that, and that some kids have more trouble just learning how to do things than others. Some kids have more challenges for whatever reason and it's harder for them to learn and you have to deal with them differently. Monitoring daily activities inside and outside of the home, knowing where your kid is at all times and what they're doing and who they're with. Uh, learning how to set goals and plan and negotiate uh, and, and trying out agreements as a family with a child and with uh, uh, caregivers, spouses, uncles, aunts, grandparents, whoever's taking care of a child. And then finally, if a child is uh, going to spend time, you're trying to, uh, you know, with other kids, which they need to do, who are they going to spend time with? It's up to us to shape them to spend time with kids who aren't getting in trouble. And, uh, and if they are with kids like that, it's up to us to be present when they're with those kids so we know what's going on. <coughs> So while this work was going on and focusing really on families and the classroom, there was a whole set of, uh, uh, but, but in a clinical way with one family at a time, there was a whole other set of work that was going on in the field around the idea of social and emotional learning. And, and there are, have been numerous randomized trials that have been done to try to teach kids skills in a classroom setting uh, that would help them develop abilities like recognizing and managing emotions in the context of peers and in the class, uh, setting and achieving goals, appreciating the points of view of others, and making good decisions. So I'm not going to talk about the background on this work, but in the LIFT program, we brought in this kind of work, but we didn't do it. And so, uh, uh, so what I'd like to do now is show you a quick little two-minute video instead of a 30-minute video. <laughs> An innovative educational program being tested at two Eugene schools is coming to a successful conclusion this week. As Rich Robeson reports, children at Bailey Hill School are carefully being guided away from problem behaviors. Tell me what an accident is. What's an accident? Ryan? When you're walking and you accidentally bump into somebody. You don't mean to do that, right? Margaret Lathrop is giving some valuable lessons, but she is not acting as a teacher. In this capacity, she is a researcher with the Eugene-based Oregon Social Learning Center. And these are her guinea pigs. Hey, did you say excuse me? Uh, I, went, I was in all the way and I was like in the door part of my neighbors. Bailey Hill School in Eugene is participating in an experiment that involves heading off behavioral problems in children while keeping parents closely and actively involved in the lessons they learn. They're doing some actual in-class teaching with our students in the first grade, helping them with their social skills, and how to interact with each other, how to interact on the playground. And at the same time, there's a parent training program. Parents have been working in groups, working on parenting skills and how to work with their children which you know, is, a, is really important, especially you know, when the children are younger. And the earlier we can catch them, the earlier intervention we can get with families, and the better off we're all going to be. Project coordinator Betsy Ramsey says hopefully what the children are learning now will help prevent some of the problems that kids can run into in later years. Such as um, getting in trouble with the law, um, early sexual activity leading to teenage pregnancy, school dropout, um, generally those kinds of problems. Principal Bryant says the kids do seem to be learning social responsibility. I just noticed from my own observation, um, you know, I'm out at recess quite a bit. And uh, in the fall, it seemed like every time you go out there, every few seconds, you, somebody's coming over and saying somebody's doing this or somebody's got this going on. And uh, now you go out there and the kids are playing. They're a lot more organized. They're working together. 
Because of its success, Project Link will continue next year, where it will be expanded to include four schools, hopefully one of them in Springfield. In Eugene, Rich Robeson, Northwest News. So that was about 1990, and it's the program Lyft was, it wasn't called Lyft then, it was called Project Link. And uh, there we go, Trying current slide. And uh, the program that eventually came out of that work a couple years later was uh, involved two main components that we're going to talk about today. Parent direct, uh, components directed at the parent, which was a version of ma parent management training that I'll tell you about next uh, after our break, and improved communication between the home and the school. And then this afternoon, we'll talk about the components directed at the child, child social skills and problem solving training, and the playground behavior game. And so hopefully when you uh, leave this afternoon, you'll have a good sense for what all of these four components, or what these two components are like. So the LIFT program is, uh, the idea is that, uh, you know, a tabletop is more stable if there's uh, at least three legs. In fact, a three-legged stool is more stable than a four-legged table. And uh, there's a home component, there's a playground component, and a classroom component, and they're all tied together with communication between the home and the school, and that they set an, a table for the child to dance and have a good life. Uh, so I'm going to now just give you a brief uh, overview of the research study that uh, we've done on this, on the LIFT trial that went on for about 25 years. The study followed kids into young adulthood. Uh, this was a study that was done in 12 public schools located in Eugene and Springfield in uh, neighborhoods where uh, what we did is we looked at all the neighborhoods in the entire area, which is about, at this time, about 150,000 people. Um, and we identified the neighborhoods that had uh, higher than average contacts with the police due to misbehavior. So we looked at the number of homes that had had police contacts. And uh, we uh, invited all the schools that were located in those neighborhoods to be uh, willing to be randomly chosen to be in this study. And all of them except two agreed, and that was a much broader number than 12. And then we randomly picked 12 schools, and we ran, and then we randomly assigned them to either get the LIFT program, this package of child and parent directed programs, or to not get the program. Then we uh, randomized, uh, then we recruited, uh, tried to recruit the entire first or fifth grade class of students and their families in each of these 12 schools. And then uh, we did uh, have done assessments yearly until just a couple years ago about what happened. Uh, so, uh, this shows you recruitment, but basically 83% uh, of the children that lived in the neighborhoods that we studied participated in the study, and 88% of full-time public school students. So we have a pretty good population-based study going on. And if people let us in their door uh, to explain the study, 93% of those families accepted to be in this study. So the community is, a, is about 200,000 people in the community. Our town is located in the middle of a county that's about the size of Connecticut. Most of our county is timber, Douglas fir. Uh, we're, based, we're surrounded by the ocean and volcanoes. Uh, but in the main incomes in our town are timber, agriculture, and then the University of Oregon is there. Um, the schools that were in the study, the average contact with the police in the neighborhoods across all ages was 13% of homes, and the average free and reduced lunch is about 50%, uh, and the average yearly turnover rate in the schools is almost 50%. This average free lunch rate, depending on the school, went up to 80%, so there is some variation. Uh, the participants in this study were 671 boys and girls and their families. 89% are white. Uh, at this point in time, uh, uh, Oregon had not yet um, started to have a lot of immigration, but since this time, um, there's been uh, really dramatic increases in the number of families from Mexico that are living in Oregon now, so that there's been uh, increases on the order of hundreds of percent in the last two decades of Latino families, but at the time, uh, that wasn't the case. But most families in this study were low to middle income, uh, and about half were two-parent families. 
in the study, uh, we have these different components. And uh, in terms of the implementation quality of the study, the majority of families received the program. The majority of the program was delivered. And program instructors delivered the program using appropriate skills most of the time. I don't give percentages here because in a typical study that ends up in the evidence-based practice literature, this is really about all you know. But actually, 93% of the families in this study actually got the program, which is very unusual in most of these studies. Usually, that's not the case. I'll tell you how that happened later. Uh, in the follow-up study, this is typically what uh, things look like at follow-up. At any given follow-up, we usually get about 80% of families to participate in a follow-up assessment. That's a lot better than the number of people you get to vote. Uh, so it's not too bad. But these are the reasons why people don't. Uh, only 3% uh, of, for example, at the first follow-up had, uh, had dropped out of the study completely. Everybody else had some reason that they couldn't participate. But typically, this is how it looks. About 80% of families will participate at a follow-up assessment, but it's not the same 80% of families every time. So here's an example of some of the findings, just a brief overview. Um, first of all, in the short run, we found out that the most aggressive children before the program started uh, had the biggest impact on the playground program I'm going to talk to you about today, which is very simple. And by the time you leave today, you'll understand how that program works. It's a very simple program. It just focuses on simple child and adult behaviors on the playground. The most aggressive kids were less aggressive on the playground afterward. It did not change the average level of aggression on the playground. But for the kids that were more out of control, they looked a lot less out of control when we started using the playground behavior game. New teachers, the year following the program, rated ch children who'd been in the program as more socially skilled than their counterparts. These, this sample was pretty mobile. We started in 12 schools, but within three years later, the kids were in over 200 schools, mostly in Oregon. So they're moving around. So most of the teachers that were rating these kids would have no idea about this program. So that's nice. And another important uh, example outcome is that parents and children in observed problem-solving discussions. So we'd invite families to come into our, uh, into our center. We would film them talking about happy things in their family and also problems that they're having. And uh, interestingly, families who had been involved, uh, who were randomly assigned to the LIFT program, tended to be uh, more positive and constructive in those interactions with their kids than families who had been in the control schools. In the, lo in the long run, we have found uh, impacts on uh, police contact. So kids who are in the LIFT program were less likely to have police contacts uh, during the middle school period, for example. And during high school, um, we found that, um, that kids who were in the LIFT were less likely to report uh, starting initiating substance use or using more substances. So uh, an example, um, you may be, remember this from, from school and statistics, but this is just a typical normal curve. So if you look at how often something's happening, like uh, if, if uh, we took a test today and it was on some subject that we're all familiar with, but some of us might know it a little bit more than others, and we scored it up, we'd probably find that most of us knew Something about this, some of us would know a whole lot about it, and a few of us would know nothing about it. So this is a typical uh, normal curve. So it's interesting on the playground that aggression on the playground in a 20-minute period uh, in the schools before uh, this, the lift program was applied, this is what uh, the distribution looked like. So the average aggression in about a 20-minute period was per child was about one type of aggressive behavior. But there were some kids who did four. And these are the more extreme kids. So for the schools where the LIFT program was applied uh, after the program, this is how the playground looked. These kids here who were uh, committing four acts of aggression on a typical playground now were more like one and a half on average aggressive acts. That's a big difference to cut down behavior like that. The control schools look exactly the same prior. So the intervention schools, you brought these kids in. The control schools, you didn't get that. Uh, this is a, a graph looking at the fifth grade sample in terms of police contacts during the first. This is by kind of near the end of seventh grade. 
and about 8% of the kids in the control schools that had contact with the police due to something that they had done that had initiated police attention, and about 2% of the kids in the intervention had that. So this is early, early effects. This is a more complicated model looking at kids at age 16, but basically what it shows is that the intervention had an impact on aggression on the playground. It had an impact on family problem-solving skills. And both of those were related to growth in tobacco use and average tobacco use or accelerated tobacco use. That's more complicated, but if you're interested in that kind of stuff, there's a reference to that in the back of your packet. So how does, so there's only been one study on Lyft, and some of you have talked about how, uh, with evidence-based practices, it's important to have multiple studies of programs. Absolutely true. So I wanted to give you a little bit of background of how Lyft, how Lyft relates to the larger literature. So first of all, and how OSLC's work relates to the larger, larger literature. So first of all, in terms of treatment of conduct problems, because that's what was going on with Timmy. There's been over 2,000 studies of treatment for conduct problems conducted with a total of 100,000 children. And uh, these values over here are, are a measure of the uh, impact of these studies. So if they all were zero, it would mean that these things didn't work. They didn't have any impact. The larger the number is, the more impact you, it indicates. Uh, so these are called effect sizes, and that's probably the, all you need to know at this point. But anyway, basically, techniques that focus on behavior or a combination of behavior and thoughts uh, tend to have the biggest impacts. And uh, more group-based work or kind of eclectic therapies are not as helpful. That's basically what this shows. So the type of work we're talking about today is cognitive behavior therapy work that was translated into prevention or multimodal therapy, which means working in more than one place at a time. So rather than just working with the family, you work with the family and the school, or you work with the family and the school and the community. Uh, in terms of social and emotional learning programs, which is like the child's uh, social skills and problem solving program that, we, that I'll talk about today, there's been almost 200 of these programs developed. They've been studied with almost 300,000 children in a wide variety of studies. Um, and there have been impacts uh, consistently across studies in terms of learning, social and emotional learning skills. There have been impacts on academic performance. And to, to give you an idea about what a 0.27 means, for example, in academic performance, what that means is that uh, the average child that got the social emotional learning program would look better, about 11% better on an academic test than the average kid who didn't get the program. So it's a small effect, about 11% difference. A lot of the effects that we got in the LIFT study are on that order, four or five or six or 7% difference between, on average between families in the intervention group versus the control group. That's very common in prevention studies. It's lower than what you get in clinical studies. And really what it speaks to is that one program can't solve everybody's problems, but it can help some people. And so you shouldn't expect a program to do everything. You know, it takes all kinds of attempts. But for some families, these programs can be helpful. On average, they're helpful for families. And, uh, but they don't solve everything. So that's it, you know. There's no magic, there's no magic solution to these problems. Uh, you notice, too, that uh, these folks looked at impacts six months after the programs were over, on average, in all of these 213 programs. And you can see that these numbers go down. Why is that? It's because the best way to think about these types of programs is not like a, a medical model where you give somebody a shot and then they're immune. It's a dental model. You've got to floss every day if you want to avoid. You've got to brush and floss your teeth. You've got to have toothpaste. I forgot to take toothpaste to Guatemala, and I couldn't find it in the hotel, and I didn't ever get to go out, so that was tough. But I still flossed and brushed my teeth without the toothpaste. <laughs> You've got to do it every day. So uh, in terms of other studies, there have been a variety of studies on the prevention of conduct disorders. In a recent uh, review of these programs, which is also uh, the references back in the back of your packet, 
a study that looked at 45 programs. About 10,000 children were involved in these programs and randomized controlled trials. And you can see that the programs that had the biggest impacts were the ones that focused on behaviors, behavioral programs. What's interesting is that the multimodal programs uh, didn't perform as well as the ones that just focused on behaviors. And uh, you see that same effect if, you'll re if you read the meta-analysis on social emotional learning. That the thinking on that is, is that uh, uh, doing more, and this is true in all of our lives, right? Doing more, more than one thing at once is difficult. Doing more than one thing at once in a system is difficult. And one of the ideas about why multimodal programs, which seem to make sense, it seems to make sense that, yeah, a child is living in many different environments. You'd want to affect all those different environments. It's harder to do that in a good way with high quality. And so one thought, is, and there is some evidence for this in the, at least the social emotional learning paper, that uh, people were not able to implement these multimodal programs as effectively and as high quality as the programs that just focus on one thing. So that's probably what explains that. So uh, just to end, what I'd like to do is uh, just read you something. And I don't know what the tradition is in your family, but in my family, since our kids were babies, we read to our kids at night. So you know, I, I travel and commute a lot, but when I am home, I read to my kids. And uh, even my 17-year-old, we still read. It's just part of the bedtime routine. And it's, it's kind of the time to be, you know, to spend time together. But, um, uh, you know, because my kids are spread out over 17 years, you know, you kind of forget what's in books, you know. And, and this is a book I read a long time ago, The Little Prince to one of my kids. I hadn't read it for a long time. But I was reading it the other day, and it really kind of uh, to my daughter, Emma, and it, who's uh, 14, and, and it really kind of brought home, I think, a key point to me about evidence-based programs, believe it or not. <laughs> so in this book, there's this, there's this guy, the little prince, that lives on this world, and right, he goes and he visits a variety of worlds and uh, kind of learns different lessons at each world, but he finally ends up at the earth, on the earth. And so, uh, and, and I don't know if you've read this, but he has this little flower on his world that he protects, and this flower is very important to him, so his flower comes up in these conversations. But anyway, so he's on the earth finally, and uh, so I'll read. So it was then that the fox appeared. Good morning, said the fox. Good morning, the little prince responded politely, although when he turned around, he saw nothing. I'm right here, the voice said, under the apple tree. Who are you, asked the little prince and added, you are very pretty to look at. I am a fox, the fox said. Come and play with me, proposed the little prince. I'm so unhappy. I cannot play with you, the fox said. I'm not tamed. Oh, please excuse me, said the little prince. But after some thought, he added, what does that mean, tame? You do not live here, said the fox. What is it you're looking for? I'm looking for men, said the little prince. What does that mean, tamed? Men, said the fox, they have guns and they hunt. It's very disturbing. They also raise chickens. These are their only interests. Are you looking for chickens? <laughs> no, said the little prince, I'm looking for friends. What does that mean, tame? It is an act too often neglected, said the fox. It means to establish ties. To establish ties? Just that, said the fox. To me, you are still nothing more than a little boy who's just like 100,000 other little boys, and I have no need of you. And you, on your part, have no need of me. To you, I am nothing more than a fox like 100,000 other foxes. But if you tame me, then we shall need each other. To me, you will be unique in all the world. To you, I shall be unique in all the world. And then he goes on and talks about his flower, et cetera. But here's, here's a thought that I thought was really interesting. Uh, one only understands the things that one tames, said the fox. Men have no more time to understand anything. They buy things already made at the shops, but there is no shop anywhere <coughs> where one can buy friendship. And so men have no friends anymore. If you want a friend, tame me. What must I do to tame you, asked the little prince. You must be very patient, replied the fox. First, you have to sit down at a little distance from me, like that, in the grass. I shall look at you out of the corner of my eye, and you will say nothing. Words of the source are the source of misunderstanding, but if you sit a little closer to me every day, so the next day the little prince came back. It would have been better to come back at the same hour, said the fox, 
If, for example, you came at 4 o'clock in the afternoon, but at 3 o'clock I shall begin to be happy. I shall feel happier and happier as the hour advances. And at 4 o'clock I shall already be worrying and jumping about. I shall show you how happy I am, but if you come at just any time, I'll never know at what hour my heart is to be ready to greet you. One must observe the proper rites. So anyway, I think evidence-based programs are like this. You know, a program that you use has to be something that you know so intimately that you obtained it. It has to be yours. It may not be exactly like this. It may not be exactly like whatever. But it's yours, and it's something that you understand. And I think this program tries to emphasize the fact that the bottom line is these things, the magic of these programs doesn't happen from interventionists, doesn't happen from the program. It happens if a family can come in, get some ideas, enlarge their toolbox, go back and work with their families, make it their own, and it's theirs. <laughs>